everyone, welcome to today's training workshop. Uh, my name is Kim, I'll be the moderator for this meeting. Uh, please feel free to write me directly in chat if you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the workshop. Um, as Nicole mentioned, today's workshop is a part of the ICP 2021 countdown events. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge the organizers of these events, um, members of the IUSSP Early Career Task Force. Uh, their names are uh, listed on the following slide. And uh, as you might be aware, uh, there are two more upcoming countdown events, uh, if you like to note them down uh, in your diary. So today and tomorrow on the 3rd and 4th of December, uh, we'll have sessions on subnational probabilistic uh, populational, uh, population projections. And there will be a training uh, course uh, on data visualization uh, sometime next year. So there's something to look forward to. Uh, I'm sure you all know that this Sunday, the 5th of December, the IUSSP International uh, Population Conference will officially launch. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. Um, so today's workshop will be presented by Dr. James O'Donnell. Uh, James is a lecturer at the School of Demography at the uh, Australian National University. Uh, his work uh, broadly concerns the demographic measurement and analysis of social phenomena in the context of population change. Uh, James has extensive experience in applying multi-state models to estimate and analyze housing transitions, the incidence and duration of homelessness, and the cohesiveness and dynamics of local communities uh, here in Australia. Uh, before we start, a quick word on today's schedule. Uh, we'll have a 30 minutes Q&A at the end after James's presentation. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please share them uh, with everyone in chat. Uh, in the interest of time, I will prioritize the questions posted in chat. Um, alternatively, if time permits, you can also raise your hand during Q&A. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming James. James, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us from wherever you are around the world. I'm coming to you from, from Canberra, um, as is Kim. Canberra is uh, the traditional home to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Ngunnawal and Ngambri people are the, uh, part of the one of the two of the more than 500 Aboriginal nations in Australia. Uh, that have been in Australia for at least 60,000 years. And so I pay re my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Today, uh, as Kim said, I'm going to give you an introduction to multi-state analysis of population dynamics. Uh, a gentle inter introduction, uh, particularly for, for people who are new to multi-state analysis. Um, but we'll get into some more advanced stuff and you can always um, send through any questions or emails if you're interested in, in learning more. So to set us up, standard survival analysis and life tables focus on transitions from one state to one absorbing state. And by absorbing state, I mean a state where once you go in, you can't then leave. So an example being uh, the transition between being alive and being dead. Competing risk survival analysis and multi-decrement life tables consider transitions from one starting state to multiple absorbing states. So for example, being alive and then dying by a cause. We can though conceive of individuals commencing in one of multiple states and or transitioning through non-absorbing states. For example, someone could transition from being alive and healthy to being ill and to dying. And this is the basis of one of the most well-known multi-state models, the, the illness death model. And so multi-state analysis incorporates this perspective and provides an analytical framework for considering how state-specific conditions affect transitions between states and shape resulting life trajectories. So this is the basic survival or life table analysis we move from one origin state, in this case being alive, to one destination state, in this case death. This is the kind of competing risk or multi-decrement context where you can go from alive to dying of, say, for example, stroke or cancer or heart failure. And then you have the, mul the multi-state context where, for example, you'd introduce an unhealthy state where you can go from healthy to unhealthy 
and then die by various causes. And so this unhealthy state is a non-absorbing state. So whereas with, with, with death, you can enter death, but you can't then move to another state after that. With the unhealthy state, you can enter the unhealthy state from being healthy, and then you can move on um, to, a, to a different state. So it's non-absorbing. So why multi-state analysis? Well, multi-state analysis provides that multi-dimensional understanding of, of how people and populations move through time and space, reflecting the reality that people live in and move between multiple states of existence. And those states are interesting and important in their own right, but they're also important in shaping the risk of future transitions. So the, the healthy, unhealthy death model being a good example where the number of years or the, the life spent in an unhealthy state is an important outcome or important consideration, important policy consideration, uh, important in obviously a person's life. And it's also then perhaps heightens their risk of, of death. So incorporating that unhealthy state, you, you're gonna have a better model of, of death as well. Multi-state analysis provides meaningful and intuitive outputs, at least I'll, I'll try to argue and show, uh, with an appropriate treatment of, of censoring. Uh, so uh, in it, and, and th the way in which it does this is in building off a standard life table or survival analysis approach, where you're looking at the risk of, of a transition in, dis in discrete chunks of time, and in this way, maximizing all the data that's available on, on a person's uh, life course to date, and then projecting beyond as well. So you're maximizing the, the data available and minimizing any potential bias. There's lots of different applications for multi-state analysis, and it can be valuable whenever you can, can think of and measure populations moving between states. And typically these are discrete categorical states. And, and two of the most famous ones being the multi-regional model and the illness death model. So in the multi-regional case, that could be looking at how populations transition between cities or states within a country, typically. And the illness death model, thinking about how people move between health, sickness and death. But then there are also lots of other applications, marital status being one, you go from being single to cohabiting, to being married, to separated, divorce, and sort of go around in circles. Uh, in, in terms of childbirth, now the number of children you have is, is, uh, is I guess, arguably a quantitative outcome, but the factors that are likely to drive so a couple or a person to have a third child as opposed to a first child are quite are probably quite different. And so sort of a linear regression approach is not necessarily that appropriate. So multi-state analysis can be really useful for thinking about what, what's driving this parity progression from having a one child to having two children to having three children and then to having a fourth children, fourth, fourth child. Labor force. You look at transitions between unemployment and employment and retirement. Um, and there are some models that look at uh, employment in different jobs. So you go from one job to the next job to the next job, and you can use multi-state analysis to look at that sort of uh, mm, that sort of instability in, in labor markets and that sort of regular transitions. Education, you can look at progression through school years and, and, and types of schooling and model transitions between schools. And so this is potentially really useful for education planners and thinking about and projecting future enrollments and where they need schools and what sort of capacity the, the existing schools will have. Uh, housing, so this is kind of touches on my research. You look at transitions between different types of housing and homelessness. And you could look at things like, you know, as sports, sport in a sporting context, like football transfers where you're looking at people moving from different football teams over time. Here is an example. I've got a couple of examples here from, from some of my recent research. So this is one uh, that was based in New South Wales. And so New South Wales is the largest state by population, at least in, in Australia. And so, and you can divide New South Wales, the state up into lots of different regions. So you can have uh, Sydney there being the, the largest city, and then you can have all these other regions as well. You could have this, and New South Wales is a big and diverse uh, uh, state and out here it's very sort of remote sparsely populated 
And the, the usefulness of multi-state analysis in this context, well, there's several contexts, but, but it's about taking account of the fact that people can move between these sorts of regions. And this then can impact upon measured life expectancy. So for example, for someone born out here in the far west of New South Wales, the typical way to calculate life expectancy for this group would be to calculate age specific, age and sex specific mortality rates uh, for everyone living in the, in the far west. In reality, anyone born in the far west though, uh, well, the average person doesn't stay in the far west all their life, they, they move around and they have quite high out migration rates. And so the multi-state approach and, and calculating multi-state life expectancies allows you to cons consider that people do move around and someone born in the far west uh, might, stay in the, might stay there their entire lives or they might move around. And this can have a big effect on their life expectancies. So for example, if you just to calculate life expectancy for this far west region uh, based on a standard life table approach, you get a life expectancy of around 76 years. If you used a multi-state model and took account of the fact that people don't necessarily stay out here, they move around and potentially then face uh, different mortality risk as they move, uh, then their life expectancy would be calculated at 79. This 79 also makes some, some assumptions that I'll probably talk about a bit. The true number is perhaps somewhere in between that. Well, hopefully I'll be able to talk about some of that as we go. And multi-state analysis can also have, have an interesting public policy application. So this is some of my work on, on housing and homelessness. So here I, was, I took a population who had had some past experience or vulnerability to homelessness. And I had some data that looked at their, their housing and homelessness transitions. And so I did a multi-state model to evaluate how different housing policy responses would help to rehouse people and keep people housed. And so for example, if you put a previously homeless person to public housing run by the government, I, I predicted that over the next four years, using a multi-state model, that around 12% of those people would at some stage experience homelessness on the street or in a homeless shelter. Um, if, you put that, if you put that same population into the private rental market, then 21% of people uh, would be predicted to, to enter street or sheltered homelessness over the next four years. And then you can also count, calculate the, the predicted length of time that they would spend in each of these different states. So for the public housing cohort, 38 days out of the next four years. For the private renters, 67 days. And so that has a really important policy implication in sort of weighing up the costs and benefits of that initial policy response, whether to put, build new public housing or buy new public housing, or whether to subsidise um, or help people into the private rental market. One of the criti critical um, or really key concepts underlying the multi-state analysis is, is the multi-state space. And so this depicts each of your states and the different transitions that are allowed or are possible between, between states, it, both internally and externally. So this is an example from multi-regional demography. We have, in this example, there are three regions and anyone living in any of these three regions can move in between backwards and forwards between regions. Uh, you also have people entering the population through birth and through uh, immigration from outside the multi-state state space. So typically this might be for a nation. And so people might enter through international immigration. They might leave through outward immigration and they also leave the population through death. Here's another multi-state space, the illness death model. So here you start out, people start out in the alive and well state. They can transition to, to death or they can transition to being ill, to being unwell. And then they can transition also from, be, to, from illness to death. Interestingly with this model, and this is, I hope they'd be able to cover this um, later in the, the lecture, but one, once you're in this state, this alive and well, if you move to the illness state, you can't in this model move back to the alive and well state. And so there are different ways that you can conceive of the different transitions. Sometimes you can have transitions going both ways. Sometimes you just want to have the transitions going in one direction. Um, and this is, I guess, for conceptual reasons, but also st statistical reasons, which I'll hopefully be able to discuss. 
Yes, the um, he's a uh, multi-state space for marital status. So a person starts out as never married. They can get married and be currently married. From being currently married, they can't go back to being never married. Once you're married, you're married. But you can become widowed or you can become divorced. And in this model, once you become widowed, then you can also remarry and become currently married again. We can divorce and then remarry. And for each of, each of these different four states, you can also transition into death. Here's an example from, from my research that I touched on. So people start out in one of these three states. These are my housing policy interventions. So public housing, community housing, uh, private rental housing with or without um, government provided rent subsidies and people who are staying with family and friends. So this is really common response to homelessness is people stay with family and friends. So it's sort of a sort of private solution to homelessness. And then from there, they can move out of this initial accommodation, this initial housing, and they can transition between these different housing and homelessness states. So they can move into different types of um, public and community housing. They can move between into private rental housing. They can stay with family and friends. This private submarket, that's things like homeless accommodation, lodging, houses, hostels, uh, mobile homes, trailer parks, that, that particularly cater towards people who have been experiencing homelessness. And then people living on the streets or in homeless shelters. So this is my kind of depiction of, of the multi-state analysis process. And I think this is valuable because sometimes you'll sort of look at the, the literature on this sort of stuff and, and you can get quite few confused, particularly between the biostatisticians and the, and the demographers. Um, and you can kind of think, sometimes think that they, they mean two different things when they talk about multi-state analysis. So I've come up with this to try and show how, how the different steps and processes are linked. And so you typically start with, at a minimum, uh, sort of data on the number of transitions that are made as an input. And then if this is individual level data, so you have data on how individuals move between different states, you could calculate a, well, in, in either case, you're looking to calculate a transition probability. So if you have an individual level data, you're looking to convert these transition events into transition probabilities, perhaps through survival analysis or event history analysis. Very often you have aggregated counts. So for example, from the census, you might have a census table of the number of people who make transitions between different regions. And so you can, you can either calculate these sort of by just add, adding them all up and dividing it by the population at risk to come up with a transition probability, or you can also do some modeling to try and come up with smooth rates, smooth transition probabilities. And I'll talk more about the transition probabilities in a minute. But the, and then the transition probabilities, are so transition probabilities are then your outputs of this particular set of analyses. And then, but then also the inputs uh, to micro simulation models, to multi-state life table models, from which then you can produce multi-state life table outputs, things like multi-state survivorship, state duration times, which is sort of the equivalent of life expectancies, cumulative incidents. And then you can also combine a multi-state life table with a, with a starting population and insert that into a projection model to come up with population projections, so multi-state population projections. Now, this is a sort of a closed model, but and very often that's, that's okay, particularly in, in a policy context where you're evaluating a policy response, but particularly in demography when we're, and particularly when we're projecting populations forward, we also need to understand um, the, the people coming in and out of the population in terms of births, deaths, and international and generally external migration. So we also add these as both inputs and uh, outputs into the multi-state models. So this sort of a, a, a important sort of micro and macro component to multi-state analyses, both in terms of estimating the transition probabilities and then estimating the multi-state outputs. So at a kind of macro level, you can have these aggregated counts, 
these tables that give you the aggregate accounts of the number of transitions and you can calculate your transition probabilities from these. Or if you have individual level panel data, survey data, you could uh, calculate your transition probabilities from a survival analysis or an event history model. The macro level, you could use these estimated transition probabilities in a multi-state life table, sort of the macro approach in the sense that you're simulating a trajectory for, a, for an entire cohort of people. Or you can do it for individuals in a micro simulation and apply these transition probabilities to individuals within a population to generate a, a trajectory for each individual in your population. And in practice, they, they cross over. So, so you can estimate and commonly do estimate transition probabilities from individual level panel data with, with survival analysis, and then use sort of a macro multi-state life table to estimate the multi-state outputs. Uh, in multi-regional demography, typically uh, based on counts, which are then applied to multi-state life table. And then I'll talk about some of the situations where you might actually use micro simulation. So transition probabilities, as you, you get, you'd gathered by now, a sort of central and to an underpin multi-state analysis, representing the probability that a person in any particular state at any particular time will be in a different state at the next point in time. So here where transitions are the number of people who make a transition from state I to J within a period of time, divided by the population at risk of making that transition. So the population at time I, sorry, population in state I at time T. So here's an example from, from my work of calculating transition probabilities for, uh, for entries and exits out of different housing and homelessness states. So calculating transition probabilities across time, a set of transition probabilities that are dependent on time spent uh, in each housing episode. And that this element of time will vary in multi-regional demography and in lots of other contexts, your, your measure of time will be age, um, but it doesn't have to be age. It can be different measures of time. In terms of data, so as you gather, you can have these counts of transitions, mm -hmm. typically deriving from census administrative data, commonly applied to multi-regional analysis, and commonly where you're calculating rates over age. Um, either calculating directly in non-panometric fashion or, or modeling and creating a smooth set of rates over time or smooth set of rates over age. And then you can have your individual level panel data from which you can calculate individual level transition probabilities. And then this is, this is a sort of extension of survival and event history analysis to a multi-state context. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the multi-state survival model. So I won't talk too much about it because it, it really is the application of survival analysis uh, within a multi-state context. So this is sort of well covered everywhere, elsewhere, and, and um, th there's plenty of good resources. This reference by Hein Putter is, a, is an excellent one if you're particularly interested in how multi-state analysis is applied to um, survival and well, how survival analysis can, can be applied to multi-state analysis. And so, so just very briefly, you can, it might be a survival analysis where you, you're calculating hazards in continuous time. So that would include Cox regression and uh, parametric survival models. You can also do it with discrete time transitions, you know, for example, with a log logistic regression model. And that the, I guess one of the, key advantages with, with using a regression-based approach to calculating these probabilities. If you have a sample survey, you can borrow strength from across individuals, um, particularly those with similar characteristics. And you can incorporate covariates and create different sets of transition probabilities for different population groups. So one of the key things in my research is, is that different sort of um, family contexts and family structures shape housing trajectories. So for example, a housing and homelessness trajectory for someone, for a single young man is, is likely different from 
um, from someone in a couple parent family, which is different again from someone in a single parent family. So you can use covariate values to predict a, a set of transition probabilities using a regression-based approach. So models can be estimated in software package. It really is the application of, of standard survival and event history analysis. The main difference is, is really in the setup of the data and then what you do after the, the survival analysis is, is complete. So for example, and so there's some dedicated multi-state software that's really useful, reasonably familiar with M state, but there's also MSM, both of them are in R, and there's multi-state and stata, which are both um, quite good. As I say, most of my experience comes with M state, where in an M state you use a, a, a Cox regression approach to estimate these hazard ratios, uh, you'd then, as, as anyone with familiarity with Cox regression will know, that doesn't, Cox regression doesn't estimate the, um, directly estimate the, the probability of transitioning over time. So you can fit a, what you call a, a baseline hazard and then add in the, the uh, your estimated uh, hazards ratios to kind of come up with a, with a set of transition probabilities. So in terms of the, the multi-state life table, so this is where I guess I'll focus a lot of the, the rest of the time we have. And so this, this now assumes that you have your transition probabilities. And, and in this case, it, we have a three-state model. And these are the transition probabilities. So these are effectively three life tables that are connected by the transition probabilities. So it becomes a... So the multi-state life table is really a set of interconnected, separate but interconnected life tables where someone who starts in state one, in this case, has a 5% probability of moving to state two by time 10. Likewise, they have a 5% probability of moving to state three by state 10. For those people that end up in state two, they have a 10% probability of ending of returning to state one by time 20 and a 5% chance of entering state three by time 20. And then those that return to state one have a 10% chance of moving into state two by time 30 and a 0% chance of moving to state three by time 30. So the life table is connected, life tables are connected by all these different potential transitions. And just like in a, in a standard life table, what you want to do is take a, I guess, a, a synthetic cohort of people. This is your little L's for those familiar with the life table and run them through this model where they're making all these different transitions. And then coming up with, in the first instance, a multi-state survival. So this in itself is, is, is kind of re useful output of multi-state analysis. So this tells us, so in my example with, with uh, um, rehousing people, previously homeless people in public housing. So this tells me if 100% if of 100 of people start, it, start in public housing, after four years, the model predicts that around about 40% will still be in that same public housing episode. Uh, about 70% will still be housed. And then a small, small proportion will be uh, experiencing homelessness on the street or a shelter, according to these predictions. And then you can compare these across different housing policy interventions to see how this varies across intervention. And then calculate some of your multi-state life table outputs. This is the cumulative incidence. So again, 12% of people after five, four years are expected to experience street or sheltered homelessness at some stage over that four years and for an average length of 38 days. And then this is particularly useful in comparing across housing policy interventions because in lots of different contexts, but including this one, the number of, um, number of days spent homelessness is a good indication of um, the demand for homeless services. So the demand for shelter beds depends on the person days spent homeless. 
So this is can be used in uh, a sort of wide evaluative context to think about the, the best housing policy responses to homelessness. Importantly, just like a standard life table, multi-state life tables um, are in, underpinned by the Markov of property. So the assumption that future transitions depend only on present conditions, not past events. So someone who transitions between healthy, ill, and then back to healthy under the Markov property would have the same probability of death as someone who remains healthy. And in lots of cases, this is probably not realistic. Likewise, people with volatile histories on any of these different domains have same similar probabilities of those who have stable histories. So for example, someone who is employed for 20 years has the same probability of uh, losing their job as someone who's um, only been in, in employment for six months. Now, so there are various ways to relax the Markov property and extend the multi-state model to incorporate more memory, more of this sort of path dependence. One of them is to, and one of the most common is to create a life table model with more and more states. So for example, rather than going from healthy to unhealthy to, and back to healthy, you could go healthy to unhealthy to uh, healthy, but, but with a history of illness. Similarly, you could say in an employment context, someone can lose their job uh, and then return to employment, return to the same state of employment, or that you could create a separate state that says, this is a um, state of employment with a history of unemployment. And I'll, I'll give a good example um, shortly. The problem is, well, in, in a lot of cases, this will work, but it can result in more states than people and small fractions of, of individuals transitioning between some or many states. And in this case, micro simulation becomes an efficient solution. The other area in which micro simulation becomes a good, a good solution is in encountering duration dependence. So in my example here, we well, I find that the probability of transitioning out of housing at any particular time is dependent on how long you've been in that housing. So people appear to and this is, again, this is previously homeless and vulnerable people, after six to 12 months in public housing, they appear to have the highest probabilities of uh, leaving public housing. And then the longer they've been in, in that same housing, the less likely they are to, to leave. And so that's, this is like, so it's the, the probability of transitioning out of public housing here is, um, it's, it's partly dependent on the length of time you spent in that public housing episode. So this would be an example of a Markov renewal clock reset model. So every time you transition to a new state, your clock resets to zero or the individual's clock resets to zero and they start again. And this is very useful for you know, coming up with a, a good um, model of how people transition between ha housing and homeless states or any different, many different states that you can think of. But you can't use that with a, with a multi-state life table. It, does, it, it becomes impossible to calculate a solution. And so that's where microsimulation um, comes in handy. And so microsimulation has a range of designs and purposes. It's not specifically related to, to multi-state demography. Um, and so in general, it's in, but in general, it involves creating synthetic outcomes for individual units within a system. So in the multi-state demographic context, that would be people in a population. It doesn't have to be people outside of demography. It could be animals or machines or cars or robots. In demography, it's obviously typically people. So the multi-state life table creates a synthetic life history for aggregated cohorts of people. And they might be real people or they might be imagined. A dynamic micro simulation creates synthetic life history for each individual within a cohort. Uh, there's several benefits of, of micro simulation, including that you can combine multiple measures of time in one model, including that you can have these Markov renewal models where the time restarts. And so you have to, do have all these different measures of, of time in your model because everyone's uh, experiencing time on, I guess, uh, 
as a function of the length of time in their own episode as opposed to a unidirectional sense of time. And you can have multiple measures of time in one model as well. So for example, um, probability of time spent in, in any bit given housing state might be a good probability, a, a good estimate of the probability of transitioning between housing and homelessness states, but it's not gonna be a good indicator of the probability or risk of, of dying, for instance. And if you wanna incorporate dying within a model or death in the model, you still wanna have uh, probably an age specific measure of mortality. You can't do that with a standard life table. You really just need the one measure of time uh, and the one unidirectional measure of time, but you can incorporate different measures of time in a micro simulation. You can also extract the largest set of measures of interest. So, you know, for example, rates of re-entry, um, multi-state life table models, they, uh, well, they, well, they, you know, it's, it's sort of the average outcome across the entire cohort that you're modeling. Whereas in generating an outcome for each individual, a micro simulation allows you to extract more measures and also examine the diversity and variability of outcomes across individuals. You can also combine different types of transition. You can do this to an extent in, in well, to a large extent in life table models as well. You, but you need to create a separate uh, transition for each potential combination as well. So you can, when, you know, um, in many cases it would work, but, but often if you have, um, you could have marital status and employment, for example. So you'd have to have never married plus unemployed and never married and employed and never married and retired. Uh, and so it becomes a pretty large model with lots of different states. And in that case, then again, it might become more, more efficient to use a micro simulation. You can also impose external constraints in a, in a little bit of an easier fashion with micro simulation. So for example, if you're looking at entries into employment from unemployment, you might wanna constrain that to, you know, the strength of the economy and the size of the con economy and the extent to which the economy is creating new jobs. And so you can simulate someone entering into employment, but if, if then that exceeds your projections for total employment growth that the economy can handle, you might, send people back into an un unemployment or keep them in the unemployed state. Uh, I'll try to show an example um, if I have time, but broadly, th these are the kind of steps involved, uh, very broad brush overview. We, you, so you'd create a synthetic population of X number of people, or you could use a survey sample and simulate on the, on the survey sample. And generally, you, you want them, you want your micro simulation population to have similar characteristics as your population of interest. And so it doesn't matter how many people that you use, you could use 10,000, 100,000, or a million. Um, but you'd want to have it have a population that has, you know, whatever is, whether you're interested in the entire national population or just the population that have a recent experience of homelessness, you'd want them to have similar characteristics to your, to your um, synthetic micro simulation population. And then once you set up your population, then you simulate transitions between discrete states. And so you'd have a transition probability and you draw a random number. And if that random number is uh, less than or equal to the transition probability, then you'd assign them to a state transition. Otherwise you, you might keep them in the same state. You keep on doing that until you've, you've finished your observation window, your observation period, whatever that might be, five years, 10 years, until they die. And from that, you can directly observe individual life ta table outcomes, and you can aggregate over all your simulated outcomes to come up with your life table outputs. So I'm gonna briefly talk about, um, we'll give an example of, of constructing the multi-state life table. So here's, here's an example multi-state space, which is loosely based on my work here. So we've got three states. So the first state is people in housing. Second state is people who are couch surfing. So these are people who are staying temporarily with other households, perhaps staying on the couch or sofa. Um, That's just a sort of colloquial term. They could have their own bedroom, but it, the important point is it's a temporary arrangement and it's people are staying there because they don't have their own um, permanent place to live. 
then the third state is is homelessness. So people on the streets and in homeless shelters. And I'm allowing for transitions between all of these different states, backwards and forwards between states. Now this relies on a pretty strong Markov assumption in that, let's go back to the previous one. If you go from housing to homelessness and then back to housing, you'd have the same probability of then of going back to homelessness as you would if you'd been in housing the whole time. Now that's not particularly realistic if you're looking at the general population because homelessness is pretty rare among the general population. And so the probability of homelessness was certainly gonna be higher for, the, for people that have a past experience of homelessness. So you could relax this Markov assumption in several ways. One of them would be to create a separate housing category. So for example, you could transition from housing into couch surfing or homelessness. And then if you, for, for those people that were rehoused, they didn't go back into this first housing site. They went into this extra category, which was how you're housed, but you have a history of homelessness or couch surfing. In this case, this, is, this, is, this example is based on, on data from a highly vulnerable population, most of whom, a very large proportion of whom, who have a past experience of homelessness. So this is, this is effectively the model. So we don't necessarily need to create this fourth category because it already is, it already is in, in the data. It is a function of the, the type of data and the type of sample that's in the data. So we won't, we just worry about the three states here. Haven't included a, a state for death. Um, one, of the, one of the big issues in trying to incorporate state for death is, well, you have to, it's reasonably straightforward to do, as long as you have those death probabilities for different housing states. So do we have a set of mortality probabilities for people who are experiencing homelessness? Do we have a set of mortality pro probabilities for people who are experiencing couch surfing? And we could certainly come up with some, and as long as we have them, then it'd be very easy to incorporate death into the model. We haven't here though. So as before, so we've got these three life tables that are connected with each other through the transition probabilities. So someone in housing between time zero and time 10 has a 5% probability of becoming, or moving into couch surfing and a 5% probability of becoming homeless in that first, we'll say days, doesn't matter what unit of time it is, but we'll say days. And so we're, have our pro transition probabilities, and we're gonna run a synthetic population, a synthetic cohort through the model to try and generate our multi-state life table outputs. And so this is calculated from, from normal general demographic accounting principles. So where you have the number of people in state one at time T, so state one being in the house state is equal to the number of people in the housing state at the previous time point, minus those who leave for couch surfing and homelessness. This is the, the people that leave for couch surfing and this is the people that leave for homelessness. And plus those who arrive from couch surfing and homelessness. So this group, well, the, the addition of these terms gives you the stayers, so the people that remain in state one. So you're taking the people at the previous time point, taking all, subtracting all those that leave during the time, next time interval. And then that, so that leaves you with the, the remainers, the people that stay in the housing state between this, in this interval of time, this 10 day period in this case. And you have the, the arrivers, the people arriving from couch surfing. So they go from state two, which is the couch surfing state to state one, the housing state. And those who go from homelessness, state three to housing. So the stayers can be modeled by using these transition probabilities. And so this is, this is what we wanna do when we wanna project for the synthetic population. So where the stayers can be estimated or projected by taking the number of people at risk of staying. So this is the number of people that were housed at the previous time point, and then multiply them by the probability of staying at the time point. 
or time interval, I should say. The number of people who arrive from state two, the couch surfing state, is equal to the number of people in state two at risk of leaving, multiply by the probability that the couch surfers move to a housing state within this 10 day interval. The same for the homeless people. The number of people who arrive from homelessness is equal to the number of people in homelessness at risk of leaving, multiplied by the probability of becoming housed in the time interval. And so the construction of the multi-state survivorship, similar to in a standard life table, is, is, the estimate, is the calculation of this demographic accounting equation for each time interval, for each time period, where you start starting with the number of people, we say 100, but this is your life table radix, and it could be anything, anything that you want. I like 100 because it can, it can be directly interpreted as a proportion. Um, but that's just personal preference. And then after this, this is this will be the number of people who remained housed, who are still housed at time 10. And as before, this is going to be a function of people that were stayers and those that were arrivers. This is the, the, the people who uh, moved from housing to, who started out in housing, but then end up in, in couch surfing at every particular time point. And this is the calculation of the same demographic accounting equation. You're taking the people that um, taking the people that move, adding together the people that stay. And you, and you use the, calculate the equation at each particular time point. And incorporate that into sort of a, a survivorship matrix. And so, to, so here you're generating your synthetic cohorts, your synthetic histories, time history, housing and homeless histories in this case. We're starting with um, your starting population. Here are your transition probabilities, and these are organized in a particular way in which to allow for a matrix multiplication to estimate the survivorship over time. So, so you can think of this as is the, the transition probabilities between time zero and time 10. So this is the probability of staying housed. This is the probability of going from homelessness to housing. This is the probability of going from housing to homelessness. And these are the stays across each of the three states. So you're organizing it in such a way as you can calculate this survivorship through, through multi matrix multiplication. So you start with your, your little l values at time zero. So this, these are your radices. So on a standard life table, this could be anything, but you know, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000. And, but you just have one of them in a standard life table. But in a multi-state context, you might have multiple radices for each different starting states. But whether you have one or multiple would depend on the context. So if you're looking at population projections and multi-regional models, you'll typically have, or you will require a radix in each state for which there's a starting population. But if you're simulating um, a life expectancy for a specific starting state, you'd only have one radix. So if you're simulating a housing policy response to homelessness, you only start with people in the housing state. So for example, uh, we'll just go back one. So this would be the number of people that start in housing. This would be the number of people that start at time zero in couch surfing. This would be the number of people that start at time zero in homelessness. In this context, we're wanting to simulate a policy response to rehousing people. So people, all people will start in the house state. So we'll set the, the rate just equal to 100. And then these other diagonal items will, will be set to zero. And then it's in each subsequent time interval, a matrix multiplication of this multi matrix of transition probabilities. 
by this matrix of survivors will give you the number of survivors in the next period. So it's, 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 it's the same as for those that are familiar with life tables, it's the same for a standard life table. You've now just got, you're now just taking into account, um, or you're generalizing that to incorporate these different transition probabilities and states. You do that for each time period until the end of your life table. So I think, um, how are we doing for time, Kim? 10 minutes until Q&A. Okay, cool, perfect, thank you. Uh, so can, Kim, can you see my Excel spreadsheet on the screen? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. So here is the model again. Um, got the transition probabilities here. These are the transition probabilities organized into the, into the matrix. And here is the survivorship. So again, started with 100 people in the starting state, the starting housing state. Uh, you could have a starting population in each of the states. That would calculate um, the transitions between multiple states. In this case, we'll just start with the with people in the one state. And so what the, what this to say, this is a matrix multiplication where you're multiplying this matrix by this matrix, and that's giving you your multi-state survivorship, which have then organized here. So this is interesting in its own right, right? Okay, so after 40 days, this is saying that 59% of people will still be in that initial house state sorry, not necessarily initial house state, they might've gone back and forward between the, the other states, but 59% will be in the house state, 24% will be couch surfing and 17% will be um, experiencing homelessness. And it's the rest of the, rest of the life table then is, is really straightforward for anyone that's done any sort of life table. Um, there are different ways in which you could calculate, this is the number of person days spent in each period and each state. Now, there are different ways you can calculate this, but the simplest way is to assume that all those people that, that transition out of that state, so people that leave the housing state, they, they transition on average halfway during the interval. And so we could say that, um, take the average of these two and then, um, and then multiply them by 10 days. And it's a similar calculation for each of these. So that's quite straightforward. I'll provide a, um, provide a link in which you can download this information. Just put it in the chat now, if you'd like to have a look at the spreadsheet. It also has a micro simulation example. We probably might, might not get time before the Q&A starts to go through the micro simulation example, but you can have a look at that. Um, and then we have the uh, the life expectancy or the the dur expected duration of time spent in each state. And this again is a same as a standard life table calculation where you're adding up all the person days spent in that state and dividing by uh, the number of people in your cohort. So what this is saying is that over a forty day period, a person who starts off in the housing state can expect to spend 32 days in that housing state, five days couch surfing, and 3.2 days um, in the homeless state. Uh, if we were interested in, I've done a little projection example. For the projection example, as I was saying, we'd need to have a radix in each of the starting states. Well, we don't need to, but um, no, we do need to, to calculate the, the matrices. Um, and I've sh shown you here how you can convert these into survivorship ratios, which you would then put into this projection matrix, also known as a Leslie matrix. And then 
multiply the survivorship ratios by your starting population to get the population projected population forward through time. I don't have any births or uh, internal uh, migration here, so it's, it's a closed population that can can incorporate those reasonably easily. But these this is why th these are zero because they haven't ha don't have anyone entering the population from outside after time after time zero. So I guess we'll start the Q and A in a few minutes. But I'll, I, I guess I'll just at least quickly, just in the last few minutes, just show something about the the micro simulation. I haven't had a great opportunity to do so, but um, so here I've just got ten individuals. You'd want to have many more individuals than that. Uh, but this is just for example. They all start in state one. They have a transition probability. Or they have a 90% chance that they'll remain in state one between time zero and time 10. 5% chance of moving to state two, and then 5% plus 90% is 95%. And then um, a 5% chance of moving to homelessness. So all these probabilities added up will be equal to one. So the additive transition probabilities generate a random number. And then for the next time interval, you're projecting whether they make a, a transition or not. So if this, this random number 0 0.0, sorry, 0 0.09 is less than 0.9. So this person has simulated the stay in state one. This person has a random number of 0 0.9, 0 0.9032, which is slightly above 0 0.9. So they transition into the couch surfing state. And again, we're assuming we test this and do different approaches if we have the data, but we assume that they transition halfway through the period. So at day five, um, they enter this couch surfing state and then they face a similar set of probabilities of moving either back to housing, remaining in um, Couch surfing or transitioning into homelessness, draw draw another random number. And if that random number, or this random number in this case is greater than the probability of moving into state one to the housing state, um, but it's less than the probability of moving into the um, housing or the couch surfing state. So they remain couch surfing in this case because it's between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9, this random number. So they remain where they are. Just one more minute to go. Um, so just, so this is the summary then of, so if, simulate this over time. And then this is the summary of the states they're in at each time interval. And from there you can uh, just count up the number of transitions and the number of people in each state at each particular time. And that will give you the, the multi-state survivorship function and you can apply this then to this this is again the multi-stage survivorship and you can apply this to estimate the duration times so the according to this 30 in the in the micro simulation over that 40 day period 36 days on average just spent in that housing state now again 10 people is not nearly enough people to do a micro simulation because you have this random this randomness introduced through the random numbers. Uh, and so you need to do many more people. So I've done, here I've done it for 10,000 people and simulated the outcomes. Where's my... And I've seen whether 10,000, how many, how many people you'd need to simulate to come up with a, you know, sort of a, for the, for the, for the number of um, person days to, converge to a stable number. And so I'd probably do, normal case, it would do probably quite a few more people than just 10,000, probably at least 20,000. And then do this to see if it's, so this random, this is random, this is caused by the random numbers that the more and more simulations you do, the more the simulations, um, the more the randomness sort of starts to even out and it converges to a, well, should, Converge to a uh, 
to a, a, a constant value. So once you once you know that, that there is this stability, you know that you've then done enough simulations. So I probably apologize, that was very quick. I appreciate that. Um, but I've provided those documents so you can have a look. Um, and that's it for me talking for that's, now. Um, I Excellent. Thank you, James. I've learned a lot. Um, so we'll start a Q&A session, uh, starting with the questions posed in chat. Um, so the first question is, um, could you please elaborate, suggest readings for the method to um, compute transition probabilities? Yes. Uh, I have some... In, in the link that I posted, I included the... Uh, I've included the PowerPoint slides so you can have a look at the some of the references. Uh, and so, so there's uh, quite a few good ones. Uh, this one by Crowther and Lambert is, is good. So this is describing parametric multi-state survival models. Uh, this, this is the tutorial on biostatistics by Hein Putter. Um, this was, he first published this in about 2006 or something, but has continually updated it over time. So this is fantastic, especially if you're looking for he, he was one of the authors of the M state package in R. Uh, and so that's a really good package. And so this is um, one of the accompanying uh, descriptions and tutorials for how to use it and how the package works. Um, and so it's really useful for, for helping you to understand how to set up the data. Um, and then the, the, the M state package just used the standard survival analysis in R. So, it's, so this package is sort of wrapped around the standard R uh, commands in for survival analysis. So the, the package shows you and this tutorial shows you how to set up your data and then take the results of the um, survival models and turn them into uh, multi-state life table outputs. So that's one that I'd recommend with starting. Uh, and then when you've, when, you've, when you've finished with that one, Crowther and Lambert is good. Um, there's Padra again, uh, similar. That's I think there was a journal article that accompanied the, the tutorial. Um, some good ones on the use of multi-state life tables. Um, Steele and colleagues. This was an example of how to calculate transition probabilities in discrete time. I think they used a logistic regression model from memory. And and like my housing and homelessness example, there were estimated transitions based on the length of time you spent in, a, in an episode, in this case, an episode of contraceptive use. Um, so that's really interesting. If, if, if like me, you're interested in that um, modeling transitions as a function of the time spent in, in each state and where you're also interested in a, um, a sort of a discrete time um, analysis, which can be useful, for example, when you, when you don't know the exact timing of particular events. So if, um, a lot of the time from panel survey data, um, we know what people, where people are at any given wave in the survey, but we don't necessarily know when particular transitions occurred. Um, so um, sometimes discrete time models can be good for estimating those transition probabilities in that context. Uh, and also um, Otto Vandenhout was helped to design, I think the MSN package in R, which is also useful. And that uses a, a parametric multi-state modeling approach. And that also accounts for the fact that you don't necessarily know the exact timing of particular events. Um, thank you. Uh, another question is, could you elaborate on how multi-state models relate to sequence sequence analyses, um, similarities and differences. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, sequence analysis is, is, is really good. I, I don't have, I can't speak with any expertise on the subject, but very good for um, sort of looking at um, patterns of, of um, change over time or, or the sorts of you know, uh, looking at different trajectories over time. So you, um, you, you'd be looking at the sort of the, the life history that you can see in the data um, and looking and, and trying to find similar 
uh, trajectories across different individuals. So it's a really good descriptive tool. Um, it's a really good visual tool. You can see how these sort of um, trajectories over time are common to and vary between people. Uh, but then, but in terms of, you know, some of these uh, valuable outputs like, you know, your life expectancies and the state duration times and your risk of transitioning between states, that's where, where multi-state analysis is particularly useful. As I say, um, I'm not an expert in sequence analysis and there are probably people on the line that are, who could probably talk about it better than I can. But in my experience, you might use them in, in tandem, in combination. Um, sequence analysis, for example, to um, kind of highlight the, the different trajectories that you can see in the data uh, and then multi-state analysis to, to estimate some outputs and make some extra extrapolations based on what data you can observe. Thank you. Um, David mentioned that uh, there is a paper in your presentation by uh, Raymer and yourself. And was wondering where is that in the reference? Is that included in the reference? Was that, was that uh, this one, the demography? Uh, I think 2021. The demography of migration. Oh, that was that's the, the paper. Yeah, David Lucas said asked that question. Yes. That, that was one, that's one, the one I sent him a little while ago. Oh, um, okay, yeah. I think that's that's in a book, in an edited book. So I'm not I'm still not sure how accessible that one is. Um, but if anyone's interested with in, in getting a copy of that um, chapter, right. I can I can help them with that. Right, uh, David, does that answer your question? You can unmute yourself if. You have, if you have further questions. Uh, yes, it does. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Um, so uh, we have another question uh, asking about uh, between cross-sectional data uh, and longitudinal data, which is best suited uh, for multi-state modeling. Mm. So that is, yeah, that's a sensational question. Uh, so both are used, but longitudinal some sort of longitudinal information is necessary because you need to understand these transitions that individuals make between two time points. In practice, cross-sectional data is used quite a lot, particularly in multi-regional demography. So, so one of the, the key inputs in multi-regional de demography, not always, but often, is the census count of the number of people who said they were living somewhere else 12 months ago or, a year, or five years ago. I think this is a standard question in most censuses around the world. Um, they're probably employed in, in varying contexts. But so that's an example of cross-sectional data, but with this retrospective component in which you can construct a transition. So you need some sense, some data that will at least be able to give you a sense of, of an individual who's moved from one state to another. And so that's readily available from longitudinal data, particularly. Um, but can be captured in cross-sectional data, but, it, but it, you know, at least it requires that sort of retrospective um, data collection. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Xiao Jie, um, asking how many uh, covariates can we include in multi-state models? Is there a limitation? There's no real limitation, um, but uh, I'll go back to the this, and again, can highly recommend having a look at this tutorial and that, that covers some of the covariates because, you know, it's an excellent question, actually. Um, because the standard way in which you'd run a multi-state model, um, particularly, mm, not, I was going to say in a, with a Cox regression, but not necessarily a Cox regression, but in a, um, when you have more than one starting state, is that you'd have a set of covariate values for each different type of starting state. So this starting state, so your covariates are dependent on your, your starting state, which can actually expand the number of covariates in your model by a factor of however many states that you have a model. So even if you, you might only have four covariates in your model, but if you have four starting states, you could have a value of these four covariates in each of your different starting states. So you end up with 16 sets of covariates. Um, but it, it, but it does cover it in some detail in this tutorial, but I think there was another paper that I might have left off in which he, he talks more explicitly about how to deal with this and how to reduce the number of covariates 
uh, in your model so that it does become a more manageable. But it's, it's, it's really about having something that's obviously a good predictive model, something that um, you know, is, has, like any regression model, is founded in good theory and a good model of, of change. Um, and you, know, you still have to um, adhere to any key assumptions of any regression model, especially around multicollinearity and, and making sure that um, you can, you know, you convert covariates are um, reasonably independent. And then mm -hmm. there are, but, you know, it's a particular issue in multi-state because you then potentially have this ex expansion of covariates in your model, um, which can make it then difficult to actually even just compute the model. Um, the various ways in which you could drop variables, um, combine variables, or um, assume that some covariate values are common across different states. And that's something that I do quite a bit in this, in this paper. So most of my covariates are not, uh, don't vary between the starting state. So I've got a, a population that, who's very vulnerable, has a previous experience of homelessness. So I don't necessarily say that these covariate varies vary depending on your, um, your origin status. Um, but yes, that sort of covariate management is is sort of a, a big issue when you're doing these um, regression model, multi-state regression models. Okay, thank you. I have a comment from Nader. Um, I think you need other software in order to estimate standard errors for the state expectancy, which is required to conduct formal hypotheses. Uh, for example, space program, which is a SAS program, and uh, uses bootstrap technique to estimate um, uncertainties around uh, the state expectancies of interest. Another option would be IMAC. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? Oh, well, I, th I think that's a, a really good point. And, and Kim, you might know a bit about space. Don't you? I haven't. I haven't come across. I haven't. I've, I know of space, but I haven't done a lot with it. But um, there yeah. are, um, and so that uses bootstrap, yeah. bootstrap approaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think um, MSM in R uses a bootstrap approach as well. I would. I tend to use um, my own sort of bootstrap approach where I'm, it, it would it'd, it'd be classed as similar to an MSM approach where it'd be classed as a sort of a, I guess, a parametric um, bootstrap where you're, you're, stand, you're sampling from a, you're, you're estimating your, your regression coefficients and your standard areas around your regression coefficients and your covariance between your coefficients. And you're using that information then to, to sample from a multivariate normal distribution to come up with a whole, you know, say a thousand, 10,000 sets of possible covariant values within the, within the, within the, um, within the, the, I guess the distributions of your, your predictions, your predicted uh, coefficients. And then you're running the model for each of those different sets of um, standard errors. So, so, you know, I have been, I, I use Stata quite a lot, and so I can do that in Stata, fairly straightforward. MSN, as I say, does a similar approach. Space I know, as, you, as, as the questionnaire said. Um, and then there are also sort of non-parametric bootstrap approaches as well, which are reasonably common. And then I think, um, I think I, it's been a little while, but I think Steel, I think Steel might have used a, um, a Bayesian model to try and generate a sort of Bayesian distribution of, of um, transition probabilities and use that to come up with um, the multi-state outputs and, and the, you know, the un uncertainty around the multi-state outputs, which was a really cool approach too. Uh, so the, the steel uh, approach that you mentioned, is it included in the, in the reference? Is it this one I'm looking at right yeah. now? Steel yeah, that, that bottom one on this page, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, Nada, is there anything you want to add? Uh, please uh, um, unmute yourself. Hello? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for, for the clarification. Yeah, uh, I didn't know that MSM uh, function in R um, handles the uh, bootstrapping stuff. And uh, no, yeah, thanks for the clarif for clarification. Thanks. 
No problem. Our next question is from Joshua. Uh, can multi-state models be used to investigate factors affecting transition from one state to another in a single model, or would it be necessary to fit models for different transitions? Uh, yeah, so that's, I, th I think I've interpreted that question, right? Can I see that question as well myself? Yes, uh, Maybe yeah, in the you chat would be you... able to, to see in the chat. Uh, just, to, just, to, I, I just don't want. To, I, I, I think I understand the question, but it was just about um, whether you'd need to run a model for each separate transition, or yeah, whether I think, you can combine um, it into the one model. Yeah, Joshua, uh, did we interpret your questions correctly? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank okay, cool. Thanks, Joshua. Um, so there are a few different approaches, and um, so with with. Steel's work and my work, which is kind of takes a lot from steel, uh, we estimated our transition probabilities in a single model. Uh, but ours is a special context where we can have transitions into the same state. And this allows us to use a sort of multinomial logistic regression approach and we can model them all together. Uh, the approach of a putter, and, and that seems to be pretty common in the literature, is to um, Kind of stack all the transitions on top of each other and so you're, you're estimating it in one model but as i say you have these the values of your covariate values are specific to the different transitions uh, and so it can make it a, a model with lots of covariates um, but you're able to um, uh, model it at the same time and so again um, if you're interested in, in learning more about that approach that this tutorial is excellent and then the other resource, which is good on this topic, is Crowther and Lambert. And here they're, they're talking about how you can just model them as separate models, um, and 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 treat each each um, each tr type of transition that can be made as as a separate as a separate model. Um, and then you can have all your covariates. Then are then naturally specific to your transition. So there's the advantage of that. I guess the only thing that I'd add to that is that that works well where you have this one directional model where you, you, know, you can go from healthy to unhealthy to dead, but you can't go from unhealthy to healthy again. because so that would be a repeat event. Well, you can, but I guess the, the issue is if, if you go back to that initial state, if you allow people to go back to that initial healthy state, then you have individuals who are experiencing these repeat events in the same state. And so that individual is you know, experiencing two periods of, of time spent in the healthy state. And that potentially creates this sort of a problem of, of clustering in your, in your er errors. So the, the approach of um, people like Putter and Crowler and Lambert is to you know, have that single and this is, I think this is the, uh, the, the Prentice model where, where you don't have these backward transitions and it's always sort of forward through time. Uh, in my work and, in, and based on Steele's work, we use uh, what are known as frailty models and that's just having a really a random effect. So you, you allow for those backwards transitions uh, and you account for that, um, that clustering of, of, of individuals and that potentially an intraperson correlation by having a random effect for each individual. So it's sort of like a multi-level um, multi approach to, to uh, estimating the transition probabilities. Right, uh, we have a similar question from Joseph. Um, is there any advantage to using a multi-state model uh, versus multiple survival models when all transitions between states uh, in the process can only occur in one direction? Uh, for example, transitioning from healthy to sick to dead when one cannot transition from sick back to healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, would restriction, uh, restricting population at risk to only those who ever enter that state and estimating the model uh, be equivalent to the multi-state approach? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you, you could have a model for each, each transition and then you combine them. Then you have your transition probabilities estimated from each separate model and then combine them into the, to the same you know, uh, transition matrix, as I showed, just as you would if you were to estimate them all from the same model. 
but yes, you can. Where where that might become, um, I guess, difficult is if is if you do allow for those repeat events. But if, as the questioner said, you, you're not allowing for those repeat events, um, then you can treat them as as independent and model them separately. Great, um, thanks. Uh, we have another question from David uh, about the future of multi-state uh, methods. So how important will multi-state analyses be in the future? Uh, could it be as important as learning the life table? That's a great question, David. Uh, uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of multi-state analysis. It, I, I don't know, David, you, you'd know as well as anybody. Um, it still seems a little bit niche even though you know lots of us can see the tremendous application out of it, um, obviously it's been taken up with a good following in biostatistics and, and obviously demography. Um, I, I find it a bit odd that it, it doesn't have a wider application. So I see it as obviously I see it as as really critical and, and really helping us to understand how populations move in in space and time, and and so really. Can I, I would I would say that it should it should be, or at least that way of thinking about populations should be, you know, really fundamental and sort of underpin any sort of population analysis and recognizing that the population dynamics are really critical to, you know, producing the the patterns at any given time the cross sectional patterns, um, and really critical to understanding. Um, the change through time, but then, then I guess the product of that change. So um, I see it as really valuable. I see it as having a big future. Um, just got to convince more people of that. Yes, I agree. I noticed that um, you have a, uh, a citation there uh, on the different states, between marriage and divorce, and that's, that reference is from 1980s. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so in family demography, it seems like afterwards there isn't a lot of application of this method. Would you would you say that's is, fair though? I mean that, that I mean that was I, obviously one of the more famous first initial models yeah. of marriage transitions. Yeah. To my knowledge, I haven't seen a lot of uh, work done using this method. Yeah. Okay. Seems to be the case. Yeah. Um, if I can just like abuse my uh, privilege as moderator and sneak in a little question. Um, so in uh, M state and MSN. Uh, how easy is it to incorporate time-varying uh, covariates? That's a great question. Um, you can, certainly in M state. That's the one that I'm a little bit more familiar with. Mm. But it's a matter of setting up your data in the right way. Just like in, if you're doing any sort of Cox regression or sort of event history analysis, the, the, effort, the trouble and the effort comes into setting up your data in the right way and having the extra rows of data every time your, your covariates change. So very, yeah. sim very similar, right? Um, I don't think, I don't know if, if either package has specific uh, techniques to, to help with that. They might do, uh, but I couldn't say for sure. But I think a lot of it, actually that, that, that's a really good point that, that I probably, um, have neglected to mention about time varying covariates. I mean, one of the problems is that it's dealing with time varying covariates um, is very difficult if you're using a multi state life table. And both, I think both M state and MSM use a life table based approach. But if you want to simulate time varying covariates and change over time, I think you, you can still estimate the transition probabilities. But if you want to calculate the uh, multi state outputs, that'd be another instance where you may want to think about micro simulation to. To simulate the effect of, of changing covariates and changing values. Yeah, makes sense. Um, from the audience, do we have any more questions? Uh, you can either write in chat or just uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand. All right. Um, if not, thank you all for joining us. Oh, sorry, Vincent. Do you have a question? Yes, please. Um, please, yeah. I wanted to find out if uh, we could use a multi state in kind of accounting for some covariates which are in a way responsible for the transition across the states is it possible for us to work that out sorry vincent you're just breaking up a little bit so that was about yeah i'm, I'm saying that can we 
model in such a way that we account for the covariates, which yep. are responsible for movement across the various states. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so in my work, for example, when I was looking at these um, different types of housing and whether, whether you got a, a rent subsidy in the private rental market or whether you're in public housing and community housing, this was essentially a covariate, right? And so I had this as a covariate in, in the model. And then I'm calculating a, a particular a trans, set of transition probabilities that are specific to people in these different housing states. So that's one of the great aspects. And you can, and as I say, you know, something like, um, sorry for keep going back to my own work, but um, <laughs> as I was saying, sort of family status is another really key um, covariate in, in housing and homelessness transitions, right? Because the experience of single men, single young men versus single older men versus um, families versus single parent families can be very different um, and involve a lot of internal dynamics themselves. And so it's really worthwhile cr creating a trajectory for each of these different groups. And you can do that through the covariates, right? And so estimating a set of transition probabilities. And so this, this would be like calculating a predicted probability, for example, um, and calculating a predicted probability under this particular set of covariate values that would give you, um, say, a, a um, set of transition probabilities for, for single people or for single parent families and that and any other sort of covariate that you that you think might be important and that you might think that um, and particularly that you might want to compare between two different groups. So if you have two different groups, um, uh, you can generate use your covariates to generate these tra trajectories and maybe the interest is actually in comparing the trajectories between you know, different types of family status. So that's another really powerful application of multi-state analysis. Great, thank you. Um, is there any more questions? Right, if not, um, a big thank you to James and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Have a nice rest of the day. Thanks, Kim. Thank Bye you. everybody, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for joining us.